Thank you. All right, we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Councilor Lydia Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. It's Thursday, December 3rd, 2020, and we are here today for a virtual working session, or excuse me, vir virtual hearing on docket 1051 petition for special law regarding um, preference for high Boston High School graduates for the position of police officers in the city of Boston. Mayor Walsh sponsored this proposal and it was referred to the committee on October 21st. In accordance with Governor Baker's um, adjustments or uh, modifying of the open meeting law, uh, we are having this hearing via Zoom, which allows us to balance the need uh, for us to do our jobs with the public uh, safety concerns today. The public may watch this meeting via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will be rebroadcasted at a later date on Xfinity 8 RCN 82 Verizon 964. For public testimony, written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov and will be made part of the record. This is a home rule petition, uh, which will create a preference category for Boston police candidates who graduated from any public or private secondary school located in Boston or from any secondary school that participates in the Metropolitan Council for Education Opportunity Program, commonly referred to as METCO. This new preference category includes graduates from charter and parochial schools as well. The individual would also have to be a resident of Boston at the time of graduation from high school to qualify for this preference. The creation of this <clears throat> new preference category is a result of the recommendations of the Boston Police Reform Task Force. Its objective is to create a pipeline to careers in law enforcement and to increase diversity in the Boston Police Department. Appointment to the Boston Police Department is governed by the state's civil service laws. Chapter 31 of the general laws. This home rule petition is designed to work in conjunction with other preferences provided for in state law, which include preferences for disabled veterans, veterans and residents. Participating, participating today on behalf of the administration are Faiza Sharif, Deputy Director, Office of Neighborhood Services, Sergeant Eddie Crispin, Boston Police Department, Police Reform Task Force member, Michael Gaskins, Diversity Recruitment Officer and Exam Administrator of the Boston Police Department, and Javier Flores, Boston Police Reform Task Force member. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for any very brief opening remarks. Um, and the, then I'll turn it back over to the administration to do a summary, uh, introduction and summary of the home rule petition. And then we will go through questioning from the uh, city councilor. Here today, I have thus far, Councilor Liz Braden, Councillor Ed Flynn and Councillor Campbell. I'll turn it now over to Councillor Braden for opening remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I keep my remarks very brief, uh, so I'm interested to hear what um, the panelists have to say. Um, I think this is a very exciting initiative. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for young people who uh, are attending our schools in Boston to have a career in uh, law enforcement and um, I, I think it's a very worthwhile endeavor and um, I'm very interested to hear the details. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, and I just wanna start off by welcoming um, Fasia, um, who I worked closely with when she was at ONS. She did a tremendous job in the South End and um, in the Bay Village area. So. I'm proud to work with her along with Sergeant um, Eddie Crispin and, and Michael Gaskins, who I know very well, all three outstanding city employees. Um, like Councillor Braden mentioned, I'd like to learn more about the proposal and looking forward to hearing from the, um, from the administration team. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, and of course, thank you to all the task force members who put together some really thoughtful recommendations. Um, Gaskins, it's so great to see you. Thank you for your continued leadership in this regard. Uh, Sergeant Crispin, it's great to see you as well. Um, and thank you to the, the administration and the team. I think, you know, we've been talking about the need to diversify not just our police department, but also our fire department, as well as EMS. 
and not just in terms of hiring, but also in terms of promotions and making sure that these public safety agencies are reflective of the demographics of the city of Boston. So we have a lot of work to do. I do think this proposal is a step in the right direction. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about how it can, how it will be implemented and the effect it might have. I've said for a long time that I don't know that this was enough to get our departments to be, to have parity uh, with the city of Boston's demographics. When you think about our city being over 50% women and over 50% people of color. And so I would love to hear uh, specifics about this proposal, of course, how it will work. Um, but if there was some thought given to uh, if this will, or what additional work we need to do in order to, shore, in order to ensure that women and people of color have access and of course are promoted as well uh, for their hard work. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and I just, uh, just very briefly, I look forward to hearing how the administration is going to talk, not, not only summarize this, but also explain how this will work with current preferences. Um, when Councillor Flaherty uh, sponsored the extension of the residency preference, for example, and veterans and some groups push back, I see this is really just having, it's maintaining the one year prior residency and the language you, I don't know why the administration stuck with that. Um, and um, so that's one thing I'm curious about that's pending. And the other thing is the timing of this. Um, this session at the state house is going to end this year. Um, so what is the goal? Is it just to have this introduced and then ultimately it fails at the state house? Um, as we all know, the state house has a huge amount of work ahead of it. So I am curious to the likelihood of this happening. Um, and I say that more for the expediency and the timing and energy and work that's before the council. Um, I don't, as you know, suspend and pass anything that just comes to the door. So I wanna know who is sponsoring this at the state house in both sides and what is their plan to get this done this year if there is one at all. Okay. So I will turn this, oh, we've also been joined by Councilor Janey. Councilor Janey. <clears throat> Councilor Janey. There might be some technical difficulties. If so, we will, um, when she gets back, I'll, um, oh, Councilor Janey, there you are. Thank you so much. I. I, I don't have any um, opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so I'll turn it over to the administration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Madam Chair and counselors. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation on the home rule petition uh, for you today. My name is Faisa Sharif and I serve as uh, Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Our office had the honor of staffing uh, the Boston Police Reform Task Force uh, this past summer, joined today by two task force members who helped craft the specific recommendation, Javier Flores, who's an attorney at Dinsmore and Scholl, and also a commissioner on the Boston Fair Housing and Equity Commission, and task force member Eddie Crispin, sergeant at BPDB2, and president of Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers, MAMLIO. I also wanna acknowledge uh, the invaluable contributions of former state rep, Marie St. Fleur, who isn't able to join today, uh, but was the third member of the task force subcommittee who's focused on uh, diversity inclusion uh, within the BPD. Lastly, we also have with us uh, Michael Gaskin, who serves as the diversity recruitment officer and exam administrator uh, within the BPD, uh, who does this work uh, day to day. So I'll just give a, a brief overview of how we landed here um, and then yield the rest of my time uh, to the panelists who can discuss their role in this work specifics of the recommendation also, and then open it up to questions from the council. Um, as the council is aware, uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd and subsequent civil unrest and racial reckoning, Mayor Walsh convened a group of 11 black and brown residents, community leaders, activists, and stakeholders uh, to review policies of the Boston Police Department and to recommend reforms. The task force chaired by former U.S. Attorney Attorney Wayne Budd worked tirelessly throughout the summer months uh, in partnership with experts, stakeholders, and with community to put forth recommendations uh, which are comprehensive and bold. Uh, they included the creation of an Office of Police Accountability and Transparency overseen uh, by a commission that has full subpoena power 
to investigate misconduct. Uh, the council uh, heard the ordinance on that this past Tuesday. It also included a recommendation to formalize and expand uh, the BPD's uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion, the expansion of the body worn camera program. It still maintained the current ban on biometrics and facial uh, recognition technology. It also uh, recommended uh, use of force policies that articulate a clear disciplinary code. And lastly, uh, transparent access to the policies, procedures and data of the police department. This second recommendation uh, to formalize and expand the BPD's commitment to diversity included the creation of a diversity and inclusion unit in the Boston Police Department, updates to BPD's bias-free policing policy, racial equity trainings for BPD personnel, and lastly, the recruiting and hiring of black and brown civilian and sworn officers with a specific emphasis on uh, local hiring. In order to achieve equity in recruiting and local hiring, the task force recommended revising the civil service system to include a, a preference uh, for Boston graduates. Mayor Walsh has repeatedly committed to implementing the recommendations of the task force, and he's committed to doing so with the urgency that this moment demands of all of us in the timeline set forth by the task force and using every tool available uh, to the administration. Much of the task force recommendations to expand BPD's commitment to diversity is in progress under the leadership of Dr. Carolyn Crockett and the Office of Equity. However, uh, we do need an act of state legislature to create this new preference category for Boston police candidates who graduated from any public or private secondary school located in Boston or from any secondary, uh, secondary school as a participant in the METCO program. And of course, uh, they must have been a Boston resident at the time of graduation from high school. We're hopeful that the council will be able to support this home rule petition, which we believe will help uh, Boston residents who grew up in the city and graduated from schools in Boston access uh, both good jobs in their communities, uh, add to cultural competency within the BPD, and ultimately uh, bring true community policing uh, to our neighborhoods. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity to discuss this further. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Javier and Sergeant Crispin uh, to discuss the specifics of the recommendation, um, and then Mike Gaskins to speak on uh, the work that he oversees for the police department. Sure, uh, I'm happy to start. Uh, good morning to all the counselors. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak and uh, for considering this important initiative. Um, uh, Eddie and I were uh, among the members of the task force, uh, along with Ms. St. LaFleur, who were uh, made part of the BPD subgroup that focused upon diversity inclusion uh, and on the uh, implicit bias training. So, uh, you know, over a period of several weeks, we engaged in uh, extensive research to try to develop uh, recommendations to help improve upon these areas within the BPD which included speaking with experts in the field of criminal justice, implicit bias and anti-racism, members of the BPD, members of the community, uh, other Massachusetts police departments and reviewing uh, you know, uh, articles and studies uh, that were related to issues of diversity, inclusion and equitable policing. Uh, additionally, we uh, participated in uh, community listening sessions that gave uh, the members of our community the opportunity to provide uh, their own feedback, both upon our recommendations and their own input into what changes they felt were necessary. Uh, the objectives uh, of our subgroup in making our recommendations were to develop a police force that is reflective of the diversity of the community that it, that it protects and serves, uh, to ensure that officers of color are represented at all levels of the BPD, and to promote racially equitable policing. Uh, just to provide a few statistics that, that were notable and, and helped guide uh, our consideration of these issues. In 2019, 70% uh, of uh, FIOs involved African Americans. FIOs are uh, field interrogation observations involved African Americans, despite their making up just 23% uh, of, of the Boston, uh, the Boston city of Boston, uh, which shows a, a disparate uh, policing. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, approximately 70% of arrests were of Black and Latinos, despite their comprising about 45% of the population in Boston. Now, th there's of course many factors that go into these numbers, uh, but one such factor is uh, race and ethnicity, and that's something that we sought to address with our recommendations. Uh, now, while the, the recent recruitment 
into the BPD, and the demographic data shows a significant improvement. Uh, you know that is in large part due to the uh, the efforts uh, of the Chief Diversity Recruitment Officer uh, Michael Gaskins, who you'll hear from today, who's just done an, a phenomenal job. But the fact that remains that we cannot rely upon someone as capable as Mr. Gaskins to always be in that position and to continue to bring in uh, diverse classes of police recruits. It's important that changes be made uh, to expand upon the pool of diverse candidates and create a pipeline from uh, the B BPS into the BPD. One of the measures that we recommended, uh, which is the, the subject of, of today's meeting, is a BPS graduate preference, and, and that recommendation is captured in the home rule petition that's been submitted by Mayor Walsh. Um, BPS hiring and, and you know, Sergeant Crispin and, and Mr. Gaskins will be able to uh, provide significantly more info into the, the you know, the actual uh, inside mechanics of, of how the hiring process uh, takes place, but uh, on a very basic level, uh, BPS hiring occurs through the selection of applicants who have taken the civil service examination. Uh, currently, veterans are given preference on their eligibility list of civil service positions and have two points added to their score for promotional examinations, which means that veterans uh, have uh, preference both in terms of initial hiring and in uh, uh, moving up through the levels of, of the BPD and other civil, other civil service positions. Uh, this rule would enable BPS graduates to receive a preference equivalent to veterans. Um, now, you know, this is an idea, it's important that this is not a, a task force originated idea. Uh, this is something that's been promoted by community members and uh, organizations uh, for a number of years. And it's something that, you know, we, we supported uh, completely. So we believe that, that this change will accomplish three goals. Uh, it will assist with diversity recruitment. In 2019-2020, in uh, the BPS demographics were 75% Black and Latino. Uh, that is an extremely large pool of diverse candidates. And by uh, allowing this preference, that will uh, make it easier for, for those graduates uh, to uh, gain admission into the BPD. And we hope to help establish a pipeline uh, from the Boston public school system into the BPD. Uh, this will uh, promote the hiring of officers with roots in the community that they're policing. Uh, in, uh, in our discussions with, with numerous experts in, in the area of policing, uh, they, they talked about how uh, having individuals who are familiar with, with those in the community who they're responsible for protecting, helps improve the equitableness of policing. Uh, it also promotes community trust in the police force to see people that you've known and grown up with from your neighborhoods who are occupying those positions. Um, additionally, you know, by uh, enacting this rule, uh, we will be ensuring that uh, you know, officers with significant experience uh, in, you know, with minority populations, uh, you know, in, in this particular case as, as class members and, and friends and people who grow up and see every day in school, uh, those individuals uh, will, uh, you know, gain greater access to the BPD, uh, which goes directly to issues of uh, implicit bias and inequitable policing. So, uh, you know, a, a couple things that, that we'd like to emphasize before I turn it over to Sergeant uh, Crispin is that, you know, the community support uh, for, for this change, for this preference was extremely strong during the public listening sessions. Um, you know, person after person uh, expressed their strong support uh, for this change and, and for seeing uh, more BPS graduates gaining access into the BPD. Um, also, we believe that because this is a, a legislative change that impacts the city of Boston, uh, it is imperative that the, the Boston City Council uh, present and, and, and you know, Mayor Walsh's office and the task force present a strong unified front on this issue to encourage uh, you know, the legislators for, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to implement this change as quickly as possible uh, and in a, a manner that more closely reflects uh, the proposal that, that's before you today. And uh, in, in answer uh, to the, the chair's question, we believe that expediency is, is imperative. We'd like to get this before the legislature uh, as soon as possible. 
with the uh, with the overarching goal of, of trying to get it passed this year, uh, if if feasible. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie Crispin. Uh, I am a Boston police officer for the last 21 years, uh, lifelong resident of the city of Boston, um, and president of Manly, which is the Massachusetts Association of Minority uh, Law Enforcement Officers. So this idea to create this home rule has uh, been in my mind for some time. I've had discussions, uh, some of which has been with some of the members of the city council. Um, I think there is no better time to enact this, uh, this rule. Um, I will say that other towns have done the same. I have a friend of mine who is the chief in Belmont, who they've also filed a similar home rule in an attempt to diversify their police department. Their rule would also allow Medco students uh, from the city of Boston to join their police department. That said, for those who are not familiar with Manlio, Manlio uh, is an organization that's, uh, that was initiated in 1968. Uh, they won a lawsuit which ultimately forced the city to hire uh, black and brown people. Um, this lawsuit created what they call a consent decree, which required the city to hire a, a black or brown officer for every white officer that they hired. That consent decree, I think, ended in 2002. Uh, shortly after that consent decree ended, we saw a substantial decrease in police officers. Uh, um, Hold on, Marie. So as a result of the, the end of the consent decree, we saw a substantial decrease in black and brown police officers, many of whom, many of the ones who were hired during the consent decree reaching the age of uh, retirement. So I think for me, when I think about this uh, home rule petition, it'll do a number of different things. First and foremost, it'll diversify the police department. Um, there have been substantial efforts made to diversify the police department over the last few years, some of which have uh, involved uh, language preference. The other piece has been um, really the cadet program. That said, we still continue to be far below where we should be as a police department uh, in terms of diversity. I look at the district that I work in, which is V2, which is probably the most brown and black uh, district in the city, yet and still I think uh, the makeup of our current district is probably about 75 to 80% white. So to me that still speaks to some of the longstanding issues about the lack of diversity in the police department. As Javier mentioned, I think the Boston Public Schools population is an, uh, 75% if, or 78% black and brown students. We all know from my experience that when you grew up in the city, your cultural competence is way, way higher than somebody who grew up outside the city who has very little interaction or whose only perspective, uh, perception of the city is what they observe or hear in the media. So the other piece is, I know for me as someone who's been a lifelong resident, grew up in Mattapan, came from Haiti at the age of seven, have lived in the city my whole life. I know my interactions tend to be very different. City of Boston, as large as it is, tends to be a very small place you run into a lot of the same people. I know the kind of difference I make when I walk into a situation, I'm familiar with those people or they know somebody that I know. I hope is that by creating and pulling in more people from the city, that will substantially uh, deal with this issue of de-escalation, which has been a big, big, big um, conversation and the issue around the issue of police reform. The other piece, as we all know back a few years ago, The Globe published an article talking about the lack of economic um, opportunity for a lot of black and brown people. And the fact that I think they said most black families in the city of Boston's overall income was less than $10. I think it's important that we allow young people to get, it, get into a profession where they will be financially stable, where they will pull themselves up and potentially be able to pull up um, some of their family members. So I think the other piece about this is this, this is something I've had the opportunity to discuss with members of the city way before this police reform task force came into play. And everybody across the board, I have yet to hear one person who says that it's a bad idea, right? So I've talked to teachers, I've talked to social workers, I've talked to probation officers, I've, spoke to, I've spoken to uh, social activists. 
all of whom are on board 100%. All right, so for me, I think it's important that we move on this quickly. Um, the police department, as much as, we, as we've done, we still have a long way to go. Um, when we're talking about rewriting the narrative of what police officers are supposed to be with how they, how they do their work, um, the kind of impact they have in the community, I think it's important that we pull in a lot of these young men and women who grew up in a community, who know what the issues are, and who themselves oftentimes find themselves disgusted by some of the stuff they've seen in social media. So my question to them is always, what would you do differently? And for every single one that tells me that they do things differently than what they've seen in the media, um, I tell them we need people like you because you are bringing in a different perspective, um, different career path, you've walked different paths. So for me, I think this is crucially important that we try to get this pushed through as soon as possible. Uh, to this day, I still get calls as a president of Manly about young people who are trying to join, uh, get in the police force who are experiencing different difficulties who are not scoring high enough on the exam to get in or encountering some of the minor issues that oftentimes keep some of these young folks from joining the, um, the police department. So I think this would be a, a, a huge step in the right direction by pushing through this, um, this uh, Boston Public School preference. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Um, we were, um, during testimony, we were joined by two additional city councilors. Councilor Michael Flaherty and Councilor Julia Mejia. Um, uh, Councilor Flaherty, if, if Councilor Flaherty or uh, Councilor Mejia would like to do some brief opening remarks or some questions. Um, oh, I apologize. To the administration, was that your last speaker? I believe Michael Gaskins was also going to speak. Okay. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to have the two joining city councilors quickly do some openings and then we'll go right to uh, Mr. Gaskins. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, obviously, interesting to hear the testimony. We actually have something pending, uh, Madam Chair. As you know, the Boston City Council had passed and the mayor had signed a uh, five-year residency um, to, to be included in uh, applications for both uh, Boston Police and Boston Fire applications. So this is somewhat kind of redundant. Um, the five-year residency would actually go a lot further uh, in, in creating uh, more opportunities for city residents. Uh, part of the problem we have and hasn't been des described this morning is that uh, we get a lot of guys and, and men and women that come on the job that, uh, that aren't from Boston. They didn't grow up in Boston. They grew up in other cities and towns in the Commonwealth and um, then they move into Boston and or, um, you know, hang a hat with a relative and then they take the civil service exam and get on the job. The five-year residency uh, home rule petition that's uh, pending up at Beacon Hill solves that and protects the city kid uh, and will increase and further and foster uh, more diversity. So we'll have a department uh, that looks and speaks like the residents of the city of Boston. So I'm, it's great that we see obviously um, folks on this morning, you know, cheerleading for, you know, getting, um, you know, a preference for Boston public school kids. But I want to hear everyone's thoughts and opinions on the five-year residency um, rule that's currently pending up at Beacon Hill. And maybe they can go up to Beacon Hill banks and pots and pans and, and get that thing passed up there because that actually does more to solve this problem than adding sort of a Boston public school preference. Uh, it protects city residents and gives young men and women who were born and raised in the city, grew up in the city, played youth sports in the city, went to school in the city, an opportunity to serve their city on the Boston Police Department and the Boston Fire Department. And uh, all too often we're hearing of stories of men and women coming on the job that didn't grow up in the city, that didn't go to school in the city, that didn't play youth sports in the city, that don't attend the local churches in the city. And so um, I guess that's that's my two cents on it, Madam Chair. I'd love to hear Mr. Gaskin's opinion on that. I'd like to hear Javier Lopez's opinion on that and Eddie Crispin's, both of which that legislation was both supported by Mamlio uh, and uh, the Vulcans. Um, it was actually unanimously supported uh, by uh, all the groups who attended and participated in the hearings and gave testimony. Uh, it's good, sound legislation that makes sense, that solves this very problem that's currently up at Beacon Hill, but we want to reinvent the wheel and we want to put some extra stuff in that is solved by the five-year residency problem. So that's my two cents in. Obviously, I'll support anything that helps get a city kid on the job. This kind of does that. But my point is we already have something up there. So why aren't we up there banging the pots and pans to get that passed? Um, and, and this doesn't really go as far as that. So that's where I'm at. 
thank you. And before Mr. Gaskin responds, we'll have Councilor Mejia, did you have any opening remarks? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I would probably have a difference of opinion of, from what I'm hearing from Councilor Flaherty because what I'm hearing in terms of this specific um, piece of legislation that's in, in front of us is about Boston public school students. And I believe that regardless of whether or not you're a Boston resident, not all Boston residents go to Boston public schools. And with what I'm hearing, and if I'm hearing correctly, because I joined in a little bit late, this is going to prioritize to ensure that Boston public school students have that preference. So I need some clarity around making sure that that's what we're driving for. Um, here, Eddie, it just, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that specifically that this, what you're pushing for is going to... Um, be more so for Boston public school students, which is different than just an overall residency because anybody can live in the city of Boston, but not everyone's gonna go to our Boston public schools. So I just wanna, I need some clarity around that. And then I also would like to know in terms of age requirement, are we looking at um, students who are, um, you know, are, um, are we looking at other private schools? Are we looking um, within the age range um, older graduates, because I know for me, I was almost 20 by the time I graduated high school, right? So I just would like to get a sense of what the age range looks like. And can you talk a little bit about the breakdown between the preference of BPS students and students um, of private and secondary schools? Like, I'm curious as to if they fall within this. Um, as we know, not all schools in, in Boston reflect the diversity of our city. So I'm just curious to get some um, clarification around that. And thank you so much for hosting this. Um, and just to quickly answer your question, Councilor Mejia, uh, the, the proposed home rule petition is for BPS, it's for private schools, parochial schools, charter schools, and METCO. What's required is that the, ki uh, the, the person had lived in Boston and had gone to any one of those schooling systems. Oh, okay. Thank you. For, that's why I love coming to all of your situations because you always break it down. I am just, I would like to just um, insert a little uh, recommendation here if possible, if, it, it, if we can be hyper focused on Boston public school students, um, if there's a way for us to uh, advocate uh, for uh, students who are in traditional district settings. I think that I think that is where my heart is. And I'm not here to change the way you wrote it, but I would highly recommend that we are focused specifically on Boston public school students, not private and other types of institutions. Um, and by the way, Councilor Mayor, you absolutely can be here to change how they wrote it. That's the point of the hearing. Um, Councilor, uh, Blair, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, Yes, just Miss Madam Chair, just just briefly, obviously, just a clarifying comment with the legislation we had filed and voted on. It started at five years, and then as a result of compromise language, it's now three years. So, and basically, it says that you have to be a resident of the city of Boston for a minimum of three years before you could uh, sit and take the civil service exam. And again, that captures uh, the city resident and also prevents someone from what they call a mattress address which is, allows you to come in and get an address for a short period of time, three, six months, sign up for the test, and then go on the job or come in and live with, uh, with a, a relative, an aunt or an uncle, et cetera. So, um, and then just a clarifying comment, uh, to, through the chair to Council Mejia, I thought Ms. Council Mejia made a statement that you can um, live outside the city and then come to the Boston Public Schools. That's not the case. In order to be in the Boston Public Schools, you have to be a resident of the city of Boston. Yeah, so through the chair, could I, I'm sorry, I don't want to be going back and forth here, but I, um, I just want to be really clear that for me, I, I personally do not think that three years in residency here in the city of Boston gives anybody any real understanding of what it's like to be a city, uh, a resident of the city of Boston. So I would recommend and, and, and advocate that we push um, a little bit further beyond the three or five year situation here. That's just my personal preference. Thank you both. And we're gonna now turn over to Mr. Gaskins. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, counselors and uh, all uh, that are interested in this particular topic. Um, earlier, Mr. Flores introduced me as a chief diversity officer and I'm always um, excited when, when people refer me 
refer to me as that. Uh, if that's reflective of the job I'm doing, I appreciate it. I'm the diversity recruitment officer and exam administrator for the Boston Police Department. And I'm committed to the recruitment of sworn personnel and cadets. Um, we're interested in the tools that would help us to diversify uh, the, the department, especially as it relates to sworn personnel. Uh, we've been very successful in the way we've uh, strategically uh, done outreach for our cadet program to be reflective of the communities that uh, we serve and where we live and operate. Um, the, the cadet program is a great example um, of a pipeline that can be created. We continue to uh, partner with uh, various uh, pipelines, including the uh, community colleges. Um, I serve on, on the board uh, for Legal and Protective Studies uh, initiative at uh, English High School with uh, Chris Green as a, a faculty uh, over there. And um, so we're, we are seeing a, a marked increase in the diversity within the department since 2017, since my position was uh, created uh, through uh, Mayor Walsh and uh, then Commissioner Evans. Um, in 2017 um, to now, we've uh, sustained a, a pretty good uh, number with regard to uh, uh, minority hires as relates to our uh, recruit classes. Um, another uh, point to, to note is uh, the sustaining uh, 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 over 10% of the class uh, being female recruits, um, including uh, one year in uh, 2019, uh, we highlight that as having 37 uh, female recruits uh, entering an academy class, which is the highest, um, to my knowledge, in the history of the department. Um, and another year we had uh, few, much fewer um, where we had 13 entering into an academy, 10 graduate, but five of those graduates that were female um, were cadets. And so again, the uh, programs that we uh, look to employ and the tools that we look to, to use, um, hopefully um, will not only um, help us in entering someone into an academy, but uh, graduating an academy. I think this uh, particular petition, um, it would be helpful as it relates to, uh, as the other speakers have, have no, uh, mentioned, uh, cultural competency. Um, again, be invested in the city. If we use our most recent class as an example, we entered a class on November 30th, 2020, this year. Um, if we had this particular uh, legislation in, in civil service, uh, it would have impacted the, the class uh, by about 26 candidates, which is around 23% of the entries uh, for the class. So it would have made a, a significant difference in this particular class. Again, if we're looking at 26, we, we have uh, 110 going in. So while the number 26 might not sound uh, like a big number, um, it can over three, four years where you say, okay, well, every year we had 26 more individuals that would typically come from uh, schools uh, that would be a pipeline. And again, if we're reflective of the city, these kids would uh, do uh, quite well. Um, we can look at other um, partnerships and, and pipeline opportunities. Uh, Jago Boston uh, was another affinity group within the uh, Boston Police Department, does a pre-academy training. We do a lot of outreach to not only get, again, make sure that the kids are, I call them kids in terms of the age group, you can be anywhere between 19 and 39 to, to take the uh, civil service exam. Um, but to not only uh, be prepared uh, physically, but academically, and they have a, a great program. And so we continue to partner with Manlio, Diego Boston, um, all of our affinity groups to make sure that we can be representative and reflective of the, uh, of the city uh, that we serve. Um, I'll also say that, you know, uh, again, the spirit of the law for civil service giving uh, military veterans and disabled veterans uh, a preference, I think is, is, is a good law. Um, we continue to do outreach uh, to our military veterans, um, but we know that uh, one in 10 um, are minorities in terms of returning um, after separation. Uh, one in 22 are, are female. So we're, all, we're always gonna have a disparate impact um, if we continue to uh, not have other tools that would help us uh, to, to garner uh, the best and brightest that relate to uh, the cultural competency that we're looking to, uh, to, to really uh, bolster in, in the city. So I thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm here to answer additional questions. Thank you. And so what we'll do is we'll go in order of arrival for questions. Um, and we'll start with Councillor Braden. Uh, 
I'm still trying to process all the information. Um, in terms of recruitment um, at the present moment, um, what sort of numbers uh, of recruits come in from the pub, from the high schools at this present moment in time? And, and, and specifically, do recruits come in from Boston, Boston public schools? If I could just speak to that briefly, Councillor Braden, as someone who worked at the police academy for six years, and one of the first things that we do on day one is have them fill out a form that lists where they graduate from high school. Overwhelmingly, uh, when I looked at those forms, most of those young men and women were not from the city of Boston, did not attend a Boston public schools, and the ones who grew up in the city um, who are from some of those legacy families from the Boston Police Department did not attend Boston public schools. So I get, I get the idea of the residency that's important, but I think it's very important if we were really, if we were really pushing for diversity and for me, the other piece of this, but um, in addition to the diversity is really providing an opportunity for the, some of these young folks who grew up in the city to get a job where they can support themselves and potentially support their families. This would go a long way towards doing that. So. Um, for me, I still think the majority of the, uh, the people I've seen come into the police department are not from the city, uh, did not grow up in the city, uh, know very little about the city above and beyond what they've seen uh, in the media, which is a problem if you're coming from some town way outside of the city of Boston and all you've seen is the stuff that comes on TV about crime, violence, murder, rape, drugs in Roxbury, Mattapan, and Dorchester because you come in with a skewed mindset as to what it is that you're gonna encounter um, during your interactions with the public. Yeah, I agree. Um, so in terms of um, also recruits come in, what, you know, this is a college town. We have hun hundreds of thousands of students come through. They live in the city. So technically they're residents of Boston for more maybe three years, five years, four years. Um, do, do you see a pattern of recruitment from those sort of folks who maybe came, came they, they grew up somewhere else, but they came to Boston for, for college and, and then decided to, to come into the police force? Is, is there any numbers on those sort of recruits? I don't know if uh, Mr. Gaskins may have numbers. I, I don't see too much of that happening. Uh, based on my experience and interaction, both on the streets and while teaching at the academy. So uh, maybe Mr. Gaskins can speak to that. Yes, sir. Um, we, we have uh, roughly, I'll say 80% of our uh, recruits um, are typically from Massachusetts. We will have uh, a number of people that are from outside of the, the uh, state that have then uh, moved uh, to the state, but we, we do have a, a, a strong number of uh, what, what you, you would call New England uh, regional um, applicants uh, that um, uh, become uh, police officers. Um, we do have a substantial number of applicants that uh, could be from outside of the city that come go to school here um, and graduate. If they're residents, they register to vote, then they would be considered uh, uh, residents of, of the city. Um, that number isn't as substantial. Again, we would be looking at anywhere between 15 to 17 percent. Um, but uh, just in terms of those that that um, again, would qualify for someone that came from California, went to Northeastern, graduated, and is now a police officer. So for yeah. the past three years, that's, that's pretty much been the trend. The majority of our applicants um, are people that uh, came from either Massachusetts or the, uh, the New England area. Yeah, I'm just sort of trying to dissect, you know, the, the, the three-year residency requirement it will not necessarily uh, meet the, the diversity goals that, that we're hoping to achieve by this home rule ordinance is, is what, my, what I'm thinking. Uh, am I correct in that perception? I would strongly agree with you, um, Councillor Braden. I think my experience again is that uh, three years does not make you a resident of a city. You're still a visitor in my mind. And I've been, I've been living in the city of Boston since 1976. So this a few years I attended school outside of the city. I think three years, you're just starting to get your feet wet understanding and depending again, where it is that you're traveling. If you're, if you're from outside the city, chances are you're not gonna come into some of the neighborhoods that you, know, you potentially could be policing. And for me, which is problematic, I've worked in B2, Roxbury, Dorchester and B3, 
um, probably 90% of my career other than the years I spend at the academy. So I think it, it's a very different perspective. If you uh, visit to the city of Boston, chances are you'll be down Faneuil Hall, you'll go down Copley, but you're not going to find yourself not too often in Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury, which for me, like those areas are near and dear to my heart. And I think given the levels of community violence that we see in those neighborhoods and the levels of um, of poverty, lack of education. I think it's important that people, if you're gonna police, that you venture into those neighborhoods and find out what some of the concerns are, what some of the issues are. And I'm speaking not only from the perspective of a police officer, but as someone who's been a social worker, who's done a substantial amount of community outreach in this area outside of the policing and who also was a probation officer. So I think it's important that you have that perspective, or at least that insight by virtue of interaction with people, visiting people who look different, who speak different, at different ethnic backgrounds. So I think if you grew up in the city of Boston, you attended a Boston public school, I think you're gonna, you will inevitably have dealt with somebody who is from a different country, speaks a uh, different language, whose fi uh, family's economic um, well-being or lack of well-being is different from yours. So I think all those things are important to make you a much more culturally competent police officer. Yeah. I agree. I, I, I really agree. And I, I feel that that level of cultural competence from, from living and growing up and, and going to school in, in our city um, is, is a huge asset that we're leaving on the table right now. So um, thank you. That's all my questions. I'm sure I'm over my time. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Flynn and Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Councillor Edwards and, um, and Councillor Braden's questions were, were right on right on target. Um, so Sergeant Crispin, um, I, I've always had a great deal of respect for Ma'am Leo and in, in, in your mission, um, working closely with Larry over the years and, and, and with yourself. Um, I, I'm just trying to, um, if so, if a high school student was able to get into the, get into the program, get into the, the academy class, what, how would we prepare them? How would we prepare that high school student to be successful prior to getting into the class? Are we looking at any training options prior to starting with the police or getting into the police academy just so that we set them up for success? Whether that's, um, um, you know, drills on the weekends or informal classes or on the job assistance or um, just want to see what your thoughts might be on that on that on that issue. So one of the things that we've initiated over, over the last few years is a mentorship program through Mamlio. Jago Boston, which is a Latino law enforcement group of Boston, also runs a pre-academy training. I think at the end of the day, if, if the city is very serious about doing this, and I think we all should be serious. I think we should introduce some kind of program at the high school level that introduces some of these young women and men to the notion of law enforcement, what it entails, and really start, start to plant the, the idea of community policing, right? If we really want to change the culture of policing and what it means to responsibly police uh, people from different backgrounds, I think it's best if we start the training at the high school level. So I think to the extent that we can, um, I would be more than willing to have a conversation with some of the city councilors, the mayor, about what, how that program may look and what role we could play in that. Yeah, that, that's, that's great, Sergeant. I think that that would be an important part of it is making sure that, um, you know, the high schools, BPS, other high schools as well, play some type of role in providing some of these students an, an overview of what to expect or how to prepare yourself or physical fitness related issues or, or, how to study, uh, just just so that they're as successful as they want to be, or, or as they can be. Uh, but I think there would be a role, a formal role would be necessary for BPS working closely with the um, training program with the, the Boston Police Department. Um, and then I, I, so thank you, Saja, and, and, for, um, and for Michael, um, thank you for mentioning the, the disabled veterans as well. I'm also a disabled veteran and I appreciate you highlighting the, the important role they, they play as well. 
Um, and I, I want to see, Michael, if I, if I, maybe it's unrelated to the subject, but I'd like to see if I could work with you um, down the road doing, doing some recruiting of communities of uh, disabled veterans, making sure that, you know, we do all we can for returning veterans um, and disabled veterans from the communities of color, letting them know about opportunities available in the police department, in the fire department, um, just want to see what your general philosophy is on how recruitment would work um, for disabled veterans. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And um, I just I wanted to mention um, with regard to the uh, Boston Public Schools, uh, English High has a really good model for their legal and protective studies, uh, where they have uh, professionals from uh, various industries uh, within this uh, umbrella. Um, assist and they, they have a, a workout regimen. Uh, Chris Green is, is wonderful over there uh, at English High. And so um, I actually have a meeting with him later on today, um, but that's a, a really good model. And I believe Charlestown is, is looking to uh, incorporate um, that same type of uh, curriculum, uh, um, excuse me. Um, so, but as it relates to um, our outreach, um, I, I call it a full court press. Um, so again, we have baskets of applicants and um, what we're just trying to do is coal uh, the best and brightest of each of each group. So we, we already have a very close uh, relationship with the uh, Office of Veteran Affairs for the city. Um, I know Giselle uh, recently left. Um, I, I definitely need to reconnect uh, with the, 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 uh, the new uh, chair over there or, or chief over there, but I'm happy to uh, uh, collaborate with any uh, community organizations and, and yourself. Um, so I'm happy to uh, plug into any networks that I might not be um, aware of. Yeah, th yeah, thank you, Michael. I have a good relationship with um, Commissioner Santiago. I work with them frequently. Um, so maybe if we could all talk or meet sometime in the future, um, that would be that would be helpful. And then my final comment, um, maybe it's to Eddie, uh, Sergeant and to Michael, but are you are you thinking about ways to include the uh, BPS junior ROTC program? in this discussion as well. I, I have great respect for the ROTC program um, and what they do in the city. Um, they do a lot of great work. I, I, I just would like to see them be included in part of this ongoing um, discussion or, or, or process. What, do, what are your thoughts about that? Well, Councillor Flynn, one of the programs that we run through a number of the community service offices throughout the cities and explore programs, and that pulls in young folks who are already involved in ROTC and they go through our program. The conversations we've had, I think I've had the conversation with the commissioner, I'm not sure if I've had it with Mr. Gaskins, is also potentially, especially for the cadet program, since we don't really have this BPS preference, is to create uh, a preference for those young people who have gone through the Explorers programs or the Teen Police Academy in some instances, so that they have a preference in terms of getting into the cadet program. So absolutely, I think that's, that's, uh, that would be a great program in addition to this BPS preference. And Mr. Flynn, again, thank you for your service. Um, and and uh, Sergeant, we, we have had th that conversation and we, we absolutely uh, guarantee an interview for anyone that's been part of any of the, uh, the uh, community programs that we have for the Boston Police Department. So they're guaranteed an interview, doesn't necessarily mean that they'll become a cadet, but we also look to, to work with them in terms of, uh, for those programs, um, we actually, I've actually done personal um, interview tips and resume workshops uh, for our, our, our what I'll call pre-collegiate programs uh, to make sure that they're ready and prepared uh, for the interview. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, you know, hopefully they'll become, become cadets. Um, we also look to track. So those that are, are in ROTC TC programs that um, then become, you know, they look at uh, the military as, as a profession uh, prior to, to, to their return. Uh, we hope to plant seeds. So upon their return, uh, they'll be ready to, uh, uh, step into a, a job in, in law enforcement. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sergeant. And um, thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor Campbell and Councilor Janey. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you everyone for the presentation. And, and Sergeant, you, you know, you're exactly right. It's, it's, this conversation is critically important, not just to create diversity in our, in our public safety agencies, to build that trust that's so critically important 
to community policing, but also, you know, these are high paying, great jobs, right? For folks in the city of Boston. Um, a, a few questions. One, uh, Michael, this is for you. What are the recent, what's the recent demographics of the cadet program over the last, I guess, couple of years? Uh, man, I might have to, I'd have to, to, to look at that. I do know the most recent class that we brought in um, we were able to uh, have 24 cadets come in and we made that 50-50 uh, um, in terms of men and women. So we, we were able to have 12 men, 12 women. Uh, the, uh, of of the, the overall uh, makeup we probably had for that particular class uh, yep. could have been closer to 60% white American and then 40% uh, minority. But that 60% white American, we had several women in, in that, um, on that side of things. So it was a well-balanced uh, class. Um, you, you're aware that we look to see who's represented in our current class and then target zip codes um, yeah. when we do our outreach and try to make sure that if there's no one, we don't have any cadets from Mattapan, we'll do a, a strategic, strategic outreach to look at uh, candidates from that specific uh, zip code, uh, JP. Um, we always look for um, uh, language skills as well. So yeah. um, Boston Public Schools uh, kids uh, kind of have a built-in preference for the cadet program because they do have to be a resident for five years mm -hmm. uh, prior to prior to apply, applying. And right. we look at that, we look at that again to, to kind of mirror the uh, cultural competency. And we do ask questions within the interview. Uh, so uh, uh, applicants can give us examples of, of how they work with people from different backgrounds. It, it would be great to, to, to get the demographics of the last two years of cadets. Um, and like you said, because of the residency requirement for the cadet program, many of our BPS kids already go through that pipeline right now, right? So this proposal would ex expand upon that, but there's a lot, I mean, we're already seeing some success through this current cadet pipeline, right? Um, but the reason I ask is because, you know, how do we ensure that this particular proposal will get at diversity, right? Um, that's a question that came up with the cadet program and it's, it's sometimes a lingering question, right? Um, but how do we ensure that this proposal that's on the table will actually lead to more diversity in our police department? So, um, Councillor, so for me, uh, let me tell you what my experience has been on the police department. Um, I think generally, one of the things that has happened, we have these legacy families within the Boston Police Department and primarily they tend to be from white families. So if your father, your grandfather, you'll find third, fourth generation, you'll find four, five, six different members of the Boston Police Department who um, are all from one family. And generally they tend to be white. So, um, and I commend them for being able to do that because this is a good job, uh, but it's not just about the pay. Uh, for me at least, uh, and for most of the uh, people of color who, end up, who have joined the police department of late. So this could potentially offset that. Um, and I think when you look at the population, the Boston public schools, I I'm hard pressed to believe that families who are doing fairly well are now gonna be in a position where they're pushing their kids to go to a Boston public school just for the purpose of gaming this uh, BPS preference. Um, I have a son who actually attends Boston public schools. <laughs> he wants no part of policing. But I think it's important that we make note of the population, the, the, the population of Boston public schools. And if we are going to really engage in this preference, it'll do one of two things. It'll pull from the vast majority of the Boston public schools, which is black and brown people. And then the other piece, even for those who are not black or brown, they will be pulling in people who have some level of cultural competency by virtue of attending Boston public schools or by virtue of actually living in the city and not just becoming a visitor for a year and joining the police department. No, I don't disagree, Sergeant. I think you're right. But I do think you're going to have to couple that with some intensive intentionality to create that diversity because the cadet program, for example, um, could be be all white if, if Michael and others didn't have that intentionality to make sure we were pulling young people um, who are black and brown into that cadet program, into that pipeline. And the same is gonna have to be true for this. So I just wanna lift that up because we can often put together these proposals with the right intentions, but in implementation, um, get the very uh, a very different result. Actually not get more women and people of color, which for me, is critically important to this conversation around diversifying our public safety agencies. Um, and my last point is this, that this is, you know, it's important, of course, to look at 
creating as many pipelines as possible. But I think, Michael, you hinted at this, and this has come up before. Until we have a robust conversation in this city about civil service and the effects it has, um, we're not going to have enough tools to be able to make sure that all of our public safety agencies are over 50% women and over 50% people of color, which is of course the demographics of the city of Boston. And you know, there's not enough veterans of color. There are not enough women veterans um, to be able to create that parity. And so I really wanna to continue to push us as a city to have a more robust conversation around civil service and started that in partnership with you, Michael and Juan and so many others in, in, in the administration years ago, pulled in veterans as well. Um, and actually grew in my relationship with many veterans, including some who represent organizations in Massachusetts to say, this is not an us versus them. It doesn't have to be. But if we say we care about diversity, if we say we want more women and more people of color to be in our public safety agencies, not just police, but fire EMS, as well as in top leadership roles, which of course, as you go up in the ranks, it becomes more white, then we're gonna have to do a lot more than this to be able to get at that parity. And so really would love to hear um, some thoughts from the administration as to how they're going to get there. Um, otherwise, we're gonna be talking about the same lack of diversity years to come. That's my final question, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Madam Thank Chair, you. just quickly respond to that uh, last piece. Um, I think we are 100% in agreement that uh, civil, self, civil service reform is absolutely necessary, which is why in the uh, task force's recommendations, it was centered around advocacy, it was centered around specific things that the city could do, but also a push for more to be done at the state level. We know that uh, sometimes bills and home rule petitions get passed on the city level, uh, go up to the state house and languish there, right? Civil service is a very tough thing uh, to unpack. Um, I think we're a little bit encouraged that the state uh, passed their uh, version of police reforms, which includes a uh, commission on uh, studying civil service. Uh, but I also want to uh, make it very clear that this isn't a either or conversation between uh, the residency home rule petition uh, that uh, Council Flaherty has championed, uh, which the mayor signed versus uh, this, uh, this home rule that's before you. This is about using every single tool that we have to continue to push for these things, right? And whether something goes far enough or not, if we're not acting and if we're not uh, legislating, right? Uh, we're stuck in the current status quo. So someone had to create uh, and reinstate that cadet program, right? Every single year, we have to push for additional diversity. We have to hire folks uh, like the Michael Gaskins, like the Sergeant Crispins that make that difference, right? The administration is committed to that work. This home rule petition is a uh, part of pushing for reforms. Uh, and it is going to make a meaningful uh, material difference in the outcomes that we see in the ways that these uh, candidate classes look like. So I just wanna make sure that uh, we are actually keeping our eye on the ball, that we're more aligned than we think that we are. And the option here isn't uh, leaving something at the table. Um, and it's really uh, increasing this toolbox to actually get at what we want and what will help actual uh, communities. I don't, I, oh, just for sake of time, I don't disagree. You're exactly right. I think this is a good proposal. Anything that will create more pipelines to allow for more women and people of color to come into our public safety agencies, sign me up. We know the hurdles, of course, when you get to the state house, it's a whole different beast. We have a cadet program for the fire department sitting up there languishing, of course. But one of the things I do wanna respectfully, respectfully push back on is civil service. The state, yes, has a commission, they can study it, but the city of Boston could do its own study of civil service. And I said that years ago, we could hire someone or do it internally or do both to really get a sense of the effect civil service has on our hiring and promotional process and then decide how we then want to move. Either it's creating a point system, opting out or doing something different. I don't think we have to wait on the state to do that piece. So I just wanna lift that, that up. And of course, look forward to working with all of you as well. Um, and anything that creates more opportunity to diversify, all for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor, um, Councilor Janey, then Councilor Flaherty. Thank you so much and many thanks to the panel and certainly to my colleagues on the call. I agree with much that has already been stated. 
uh, in terms of the importance of utilizing every tool in the toolkit, creating new tools so that we see the diversity that we want to see reflected in the Boston Police Department. Um, I, you know, I, I want to kind of go deeper into the data and just building upon Councilor Campbell's questions. Um, and it's going to be really important for me to see actual hard numbers for me to uh, wanna move this forward. And I definitely wanna move this forward. I think focusing on um, our students is a good way to go. I, I worry that the fact that it doesn't explicitly and exclusively focus on BPS kids, that we will end up in the same problems that we already have. So we're gonna see, we're gonna see um, with this preference, a bunch of kids from BC High, no offense to Councilor Flaherty, I know that's his alma mater, but we're not going to see is, is, is students from, uh, you know, the Burke. And so I worry that this isn't going far enough. I would be very interested in unpacking the recent cadet classes as well as the force itself to understand how many folks have attended and graduated from one of these Boston schools as outlined in this ordinance, and then understand that by race and by neighborhood. Can that data be presented? And I understand if you don't have it at your fingertips right now, Michael, but it'd be very important for us to kind of dig through that data. Because if we find that the cadet classes or our current force, um, you know, we looking, we're looking at the Boston graduates and we still find that the large majority are from uh, private schools or Catholic schools and are not BPS students and we're not getting the diversity that we hope to see, then I worry that we're gonna miss the mark. I, I'm all for a preference that prioritizes our students, but I think if the goal is, and I believe that this is the goal, uh, is to create another tool that would lead, get us closer toward um, a police force that reflects the diversity of our city, I just worry that we'll miss it because it's not exclusive to BPS students and that we'll continue to see um, the lack of diversity. So are you able to get that, that data set for us? I'm really interested an understanding of the cadet classes, as well as the force, the police department, the force, um, who has graduated from Boston Public Schools. I don't, do you collect that data currently? Um, Ma'am, we, we would be able to, to provide that data for uh, cadets uh, more recently for, since 2016. I'm not sure I would be able to uh, be able to go beyond that. And that is also true of our recruit classes. Um, I did a real quick uh, overlay of if this particular bill was enacted uh, for this most recent class, it would impact the class by 23% right now. So of 110, uh, there would be 23% more BPS students that would be a part of, uh, of this particular class. Um, BPS way. or Boston graduates? Uh, I'll say Boston. Let's not, let's not use that interchangeably. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were some Boston high school students that were would be part of that 23%. So I, so I would what have I, What I really want to do, though, is try to unpack Boston public schools, meaning you graduated from one of Boston public schools mm -hmm. versus a Catholic school or Metco or the other schools that are listed in the ordinance mm -hmm. so that we truly see um, if we're going to get there. If you have that, I'd be really interested. Is that something we could share? Um, that, that's something share that, 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 I can, that I can try to uh, put together uh, for you in a, in a timely fashion. I appreciate you. Thank sure. you so much. I mean, that's really it for me, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I want to dig deep into the data to see if we could use this as a way to get the, the diversity that we hope to get. Um, and if we're not seeing that, then I wonder what we do to tweak this. My suggestion would be is that we focus on Boston Public School um, graduates solely. Councillor Janie, that was actually a, a really thoughtful point and it's come up several times uh, from Councillor Mejia and also uh, uh, Madam Chair specifically about why was this language uh, crafted the way that it was crafted. So thank you so much uh, for raising that. And I actually want to ask uh, Javier Flores um, and uh, Sergeant Crispin to speak to this because the recommendation. I, actually, that. I do appreciate that, but I'm going to go through the round of, uh, of counselors. We're going to drive that, 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 that question first. 
So after Councillor Janey, uh, with Councillor Flaherty, then Councillor Mejia, then myself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, obviously, on, on a footnote on um, sort of on the previous speaker, I know just speaking about my alma mater, that's gone to great lengths uh, in terms of uh, outreach and recruitment uh, throughout the entire city of Boston and, uh, and have seen significant gains uh, in students of color, uh, particularly students uh, that come from, uh, from poverty and uh, in some really tough circumstances who are now currently enrolled over at BCI. So I don't want to overlook uh, that, um, that group of individuals, uh, as well as efforts that are being made to continue to foster um, uh, more uh, equity and involvement in, in those schools. So uh, it's a completely different school today than it was uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So given those gains, uh, I would not want to see, you know, a city kid, particularly a Haitian kid from Dorchester or a Vietnamese kid from Fields Corner that's currently at BC High uh, with uh, not a lot of means in their respective households uh, be able to potentially compete. Uh, and to get on the Boston Police Department. So I, I want to, I'd be remiss if I did not say that clearly the focus is on Boston public schools, but as we start to see uh, schools that uh, call Boston their home, continue to diversify their enrollment and make efforts to reach out and make efforts to, uh, to particularly for some of our neediest residents, uh, I would not want to hamper the, that uh, student, that child's ability to, to gain access. So, uh, but I want to shift gears and, and ask, uh, I just need to get clarity from, from the panel. What is your definition or description of a mattress address? Because I'm not explaining the three year rule. And to, to Faisha's point, uh, if we may maybe amend this current home rule petition to go from one year to three, it solves the problem. The biggest impediment that we have currently with respect to the civil service exam is it takes about a year for the whole process. You fill out the application, you sit for the exam, you wait for the exam to be graded, you wait for civil service to, civil service to certify the exam, so in a sense, about a year passes. The biggest impediment to a city kid gaining access to, to, to participate in or to get the postcard uh, for employment is the mattress address impediment. And I need to hear from someone from the police department as to what is your definition of a mattress address? My definition is a kid that is not from the city, didn't grow up in the city, didn't go to school in the city, didn't play youth sports in the city, but they have a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin that does live in the city. So they use their address. They fill out the application and they start the process, the process which takes about a year. We only have a minimum of one year uh, residence requirement for you to sit for the test and to be considered. By moving it from one year to three years, we disincentivize that whole loophole, if you will, and that's the biggest impediment for non-veteran kids of the city, because there's only so many seats per class, per academy. A significant number of those seats are being taken by people that have a mattress address, which is why it's important to move the requirement from one year residency to three years. My idea of the three year residency, as just described briefly, it's not about who knows the city and who can get from Porter Square to Maverick Square to Union Square to... I get that. This is, the, this is about the test. This is about who can sit for the test. And currently the one year residency requirement that, that, that allows you to sit for the test doesn't go far enough to, to, to prevent the mattress address loophole. That's why we currently have something pending up at, up at, the, up at Beacon Hill to move it from one year to three years, because that's a different equation. You can plop down for one year at your aunt's house or your grandmother's house and kind of ride out the application process. If you're required to get a lease for three years or to move in for three years, that's a different conversation. And that would dissuade a lot of folks from taking advantage of the mattress address loophole. So I just wanna be clear as to why we went from one year to three years. It was to attack, to prevent the mattress address phenomenon, which permeates every single class that we put on on the department. So this isn't a knock on our, uh, our, our veterans or on uh, men and women of the police department, but we're trying to get more city kids, more kids that are born and raised, educated and played youth sports and art and dance and music in Boston who know the neighborhoods on the job. The biggest hurdle right now for that to happen is the mattress address loophole which is why it's important to go from one year to three years. I'm not saying a guy that's lived here for three years knows Dorchester like the back of his hand, not even the point. The point of going from one year to three years, I want to be very clear, not only with my newer colleagues, but also with the panel, 
as to why we went from why we're proposing going from one year to three years, it's to attack the mattress address. So can someone tell me their de definition of mattress address and how that's an impediment to men and women and people of color from Boston to get on the job? Because there's only so many seats available. And once we do that, we're going to see a huge difference in the number of city kids being able to compete for the non-veteran slots in each class, in each academy for the Boston Police Department. So, Fasia, to your point, if we could include or amend the language to go from one year to three years, it kind of satisfies both. Because as Councilor Campbell said, I'm on board with all of what helps a city kid get on the job. And the problem we have right now is they're competing with the mattress address. And we have to eliminate the mattress address. One year doesn't do it. Three years, five years would definitely do it. Three years would put a big dent in it. So thank you, Madam Chair. So I need to hear from someone from the police department to extract, to explain to me what they think a mattress address is and how they would agree that going from one year to three year would completely probably eliminate the mattress address loophole that will now allow more kids from the city of Austin to participate and potentially get into these academy classes. We're just chomping at the edges. The, the, the facts are that. Um, and, and I'll, because I, I want to, redirect uh, just just a bit. Uh, if, if our goal is to get more city kids into the BPD, then, then this proposal is the superior one. And, and the reason for that is there, there, there can be no mattress addresses if there's a requirement that you graduated from the Boston police or from the Boston public schools or Metco uh, in order to gain this preference. So that eliminates that entirely. The other issue is that Fulfilling the three-year residency obligation uh, gets into issues of income and, and wealth. And as we know, uh, the costs of living in the city are extensive. And so what you're doing is you are potentially punishing low-income people within the city uh, who have to satisfy that three-year residency obligation, uh, which are who are primarily black and brown, and rewarding those who have the means to come in and fulfill that three-year residency requirement, whether that be, uh, you know, in high school age, or whether that be immediately following high school. As mentioned, completing the process of, of taking the civil service exam and getting admission to the police department takes a year. If you have an 18 year old kid from a low income family who loses their housing upon graduation from high school, maybe can't continue to live with, with their parents or uh, is, has housing through some other means, they may be forced to leave the city and go to uh, a, an income that is, or a, a, a location uh, that is more, uh, you know, that they can afford, and that would thereby forfeit their residency. To the chair, um, to Avi, Avi, you're missing the point. The point is that I know so many people on the job that aren't from Boston. They didn't grow up in Boston. What they did was they used their grandmother's address and or their aunt or uncle or they temporarily moved in with a cousin. They took the test, they waited for the test to be graded, they waited for civil service to certify the test, and then they got the postcard with an offer of employment, and then they decided to move in to Boston because there's now a 10-year residency requirement. It has nothing to do with, with, with wealth, it has all to do with if you have access to someone that has an address, it's called a mattress address for a reason, it's a loophole. So nothing just... to do with nothing to do with economics or financial means. If you got an address that you could put down that says you live there, right, and it's a one-year process, that's a loophole, Javier. That has to be closed. Okay, but that's a separate... because if, you, if you're asking someone to do it for three years, that's a big commitment in someone's life. Oh, gee, I can just suck up a year, put down my cousin's address, and pick a neighborhood and kind of write out the application process. And if I get the postcard, great, I'll move in. If I don't get the postcard, then I'll stay in, pick a neighborhood, Arlington, Belmont, Newton, Wayland, Malden, Medford, Plymouth, et cetera. That's what happens, um, yeah. So the men and women that you work, I, I, can, I, I mean, I work with them. I, I worked in the DA's office with a lot of them. I work currently now with them. There are a lot of men and women that are on the job that are not from Boston. And they readily admit that they used the mattress address and they got the postcard and then they decided to move in. We have to eliminate that because that's a seat. That's a seat in the class. That's a seat in the academy. That's a job that could be going to a city kid. 
but for the mattress address loophole. Eliminate the mattress address loophole. More people from the city, more city kids will get on the job, period. The, the solution here is the home rule you have in front of us, as well intentions as it is, it only allows for one year. If we amend it to three years, we solve both. We eliminate the mattress address loophole, and then we obviously allow kids that went to Boston Public Schools and, and, and other, others to get preference, which is obviously the goal here. We want a department that is reflective of the face and the languages that are spoken in Boston. I get it. I support it. But the problem is, is the mattress address loophole still exists until we kill it. And we do that by an, amending this home rule petition to move from one year to three years so that it joins the one that's currently up in Beacon Hill. Does it solve the problem? No, but it eliminates and disincentivizes the mattress address loophole phenomenon that exists on your department. And I can point to people I know personally that did not grow up in Boston, did not go to school in Boston, did not play youth sports in Boston. In fact, I played against them for other cities and towns, and they're on the job. Why? Mattress address. But if but I could just requires graduation from Boston public schools. Uh, two points. One, by providing this preference, you are mitigating the harm that's caused by the mattress address because you're now giving graduates of BPS preference over those individuals who may use a mattress address. And I think everyone agrees that that is a problem. I think but it's a separate problem eliminating it entirely that needs to be addressed through a separate mechanism. Uh, Point of clarification, Javier, it is not BPS, right? It is BPS, Catholic schools, METCO, and other places as well. And that is that schools, right? Schools so within the compact. Right. Correct. Okay. And, you know, so that, that's an issue that we considered and we, and we talked about extensively in, in reviewing this. And what we decided was to include METCO uh, because we don't want to pub we don't want to punish city residents and uh, particularly low income residents who are given the opportunity to attend school through Metco in a suburban location. Those individuals should be given the same opportunities as BPS graduates. And uh, it's my understanding that the demographics of Metco uh, reflect uh, those of BPS in, in that they have a high uh, proportion of Black and Brown students. Uh, similarly, we didn't want to punish individuals who opt to uh, attend a magnet school, uh, which similarly uh, have demographics equivalent uh, to BPS, based upon my experience going to those schools and speaking to them about uh, becoming a minority uh, attorney. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the last point I, I want to make in response to uh, Councilor Flaherty is that uh, the, this, there is no, I, I think that this eliminates the mattress address issue in, in the in the context of uh, no one, I mean, unless he has a separate experience, it, it, it's, I think it's going to be rare if, if it exists at all that an individual will move and go to a BPS school to obtain their high school diploma or any school within the city that, that would qualify them, uh, you know, pursuant to this uh, through a mattress address in order to gain access to the preference. What, with one exception, through the chair, through the chair, just one exception, Javier. The only one exception is that age forty. It's not just high school kids; it's age Council, forty. Right, but Councilor Flaherty, um, because there's still two other counselors who have questions, and I've we've heard the suggestion to the administration, which is just combine the two. So that's on the floor for the administration to answer if they're going to do that or not. Or, or if it, if we're going to amend it ourselves, Council Clarity, as you know, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that because it's not just about high school students. You can get on the job up to age 40. So this is for people in their 30s and in, in, in the late 20s, early 30s. So not just about the high school kid. It's about the person that can slap down a mattress address. That has to stop. And, uh, and it's a big problem. So as many tools in the tool share we can use, and that's one of them. So we're not saying different things. We want the same thing. We just need this uh, mattress address phenomenon and loophole closed. And it doesn't just pertain to where kids are going to go to high school. It's particularly in this economy, people start losing their jobs. They're going to put down a mattress address and they're going to be coming on the job. And that's going to eliminate a city kid from getting the job. It's, it's common sense. But thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your, your patience on it. Thank you very much. Councilor Mejia, then I have some questions. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Um, so I, I'm, it would be helpful to me. I think the goal, and I, and I said this earlier in my comments, um, beforehand in terms of really who it is that we're trying to um, engage, right? So I'm seeing this as an opportunity to right the wrong, as an opportunity to engage more black and brown and low income students 
in these opportunities, right? So if that is the goal, then I would recommend that we modify this language in a way that, as I mentioned earlier, that is specifically to Boston Public School students in BPS. And Javier, I do appreciate and understand the MECO situation. So I think that, um, I, I do think it makes sense for them to be included. Um, and I also, I, I think that, I think where we might be able to find some even ground is perhaps not include students who are in private schools, right? Because there's a lot of, even though they get scholarships, there's still, you know, there's still access to wealth there that some kids may not have too. So maybe that could be one way for us to handle that situation. But I think all in all, I, um, I feel like every single conversation that I'm having this year, on this council, um, it just continues to remind me of how racially segregated the city of Boston is. So I feel like this same conversation that we're having about the police department and, and recruitment is the same conversation that I felt like I was having about the exam schools in the Boston public schools. And I feel like every single twist and turn, it brings us it brings us right back to the fact that people of color in the city of Boston are not reflected and are not engaging and are not um, moving forward. And I think that if we are serious about moving this conversation to where it needs to go, you know, I'm beyond the mattress situation. I, I think that it needs to be more than three years and it needs to be explicit about Boston public school students. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I agree with whoever said, I think it was um, Eddie, you mentioned earlier, like three years is not enough for you to know what it's like to be a Bostonian, right? I think that lived experience matters and I, and I think that we need to go beyond three years. I, I think, um, I think you're, the way that you're going about this in terms of recruitment and focusing on the schools is the way to go. Um, and I'm in full support of that. And I think that uh, I, it's not, I really don't have any questions. I just think at this point, I just want us to move beyond this conversation and let's just get to the work at hand, which is diversifying our police force so that it could be more reflective of the people who are living the realities, right? And doing everything that we can to remove those barriers so that we have um, the representation that we all have been yearning for, for the last 50,000 years, right? Let's just move on. It's like, I don't even understand why we were having this conversation, to be honest with you. This should have already been done years ago. So let's just let's just keep it moving and let's let's get at it. Period. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Really helping to reset, I think, the tone and the focus, which um, again to remind all of us, we do all want the same thing here. We do want a more diverse police department reflective of the city of Boston. And the the, the real question is just how we're gonna get there. So I have several questions uh, for the administration. Uh, one is first with regards to, I think it was, uh, may have been Eddie, um, who mentioned the consent decree that we had at one point that required a one for one. And I believe the consent decree was what, mandated by a court? Court order, yes, and, correct. Okay, and when did it end? I think sometime around 2002, um, 2003 or so, sometime around there. And it worked. That's what you said, right? Yes. It um, did work. It did work. And I I, let me just, if I could just jump in real briefly. Initially, when we got the court order. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't want to cut you off. Okay. But I really want to go, go down this yep. line of questioning. Mm -hmm. And then I will get back to you um, for anything else outside of this. Um, my question to the administration is, in looking at that consent decree, has there been any appetite to just revamp it? You have something that worked, the city of Boston did it. It was mandated by a court, which I assume would mean that it was passed constitutional muster. Why on earth, I mean, I, we can't speak to a prior administration's allowance of it to just go away and not continue it. But I really would like to know, you have, that's not a home rule. That was an agreement or that was mandated. Why on earth not go back to something that worked before? I think uh, if, if I may, I can speak to that. Um, the cons a consent decree would be ordered by um, by a court. So it, it has to be something that, you know, someone else would have to uh, um, propose. 
And um, it's not just something that we can just go back into almost a lawsuit or some type of uh, official. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't, th I don't think that that's accurate. I, okay. I don't think that that's accurate. And you had a consent decree. You, you were mandated, you were performing according to said consent decree, it ended. Why on earth not extend? I mean, we can't speak to why they didn't extend it or continue on with the program. But also why, why has, what I'm hearing and thing is, I don't think anyone even thought about it to look at the consent decree and bring it back. I think that was it's based on numbers at the time. So I, right. I think at some point. Today, of the folks who are on right now, did anyone look at the consent decree and say, is there a possibility to bring this back? No, right? That wasn't part of the task force's conversations in terms of. Okay. I think it should be. And I think you should consider that. You have something that is not dependent on a state house or vote that the city of Boston had to comply with. I mean, there could be a perfectly legal response saying, uh, we don't want to, or we don't think it would pass today's constitutional buster under the now right, right center, right leaning court system. I don't know what the hell it is, but I'm, I'm disappointed that, that you have a system that worked that no, no one looked at. That doesn't require all this political back and forth. So that's one thing for me to support that you looked at everything and truly did due diligence as to the best way to diversify this police force that, that you look at that and pull from that and see how this could be implemented today. There should have been a response. We looked at it, we decided X, Y, and Z couldn't pass constitutional muster, excuse me, um, that um, we, we expected opposition, we expected something, but it 2002, it was working. Ma Madam so. Chair, if I, if I may, I just wanted to say that a consent decree does have to come from a lawsuit. So um, just, just for, you know, point no, no, of order. I it's not something that we can just from. implement. The continuance, the continuance of it, of a program that works, right? Absolutely. That's so, but I'm but if it, if it if it if it stopped in 2002, one, I'm perfectly clear on that. Okay. Integrating schools around the country, all of those things have come from consent decrees, reports, all this other stuff like that. And this, not this administration, but the city of Boston let it die after it was done and working. So I, I think part so, of the reason it came to an end. Again, this is about the conversation, the tools in the toolbox, the mindsets, and going into seeing what we can do. We had something that worked. What I heard today is no one looked at that. No one considered it an option. So well, that's so. Sure. That's, that's, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't think, I, I'm not sure that a consent decree would stand up to uh, to legal challenge. I think you're, you and I are having two different conversations. No one, except for right now, pontificating on this Zoom call right now, looked at it. That's what I heard. No one looked at whether it could be brought in. So anything coming now from the task force of the administration or anything else is speculating well, about whether this could or couldn't happen. So here's, it is, it is speculation. And I could very well be, it, there could be very well a perfectly fine answer as to why we can or cannot, why we can modify, why we what well, we could extend, are there examples of cities out there saying this is working for us, we're gonna continue on with this program or we're gonna bring it back. None of that research was done. Well, or it not, was. How did you do yeah, that research? We, we, looked, we looked at how other cities, what, what measures other cities have taken to diversify their police forces. And, and that's not what I asked about. I asked about the consent decree and extension of things I, I in our culture. Any city that has what would be the equivalent of a consent decree, uh, I, I, it's not something we, we looked at extensively because I don't okay. think it's okay. there. And I okay. don't think that's that, right. that, okay. If, okay. if I no, could jump. That's, that's it on the consent decree. That's it on the consent decree. You guys didn't look if at I could, it. You if didn't I look can just speak briefly, please. Um, I think the issue of consent decree has been discussed at Mamlio. I think one of the reasons it came to an end was that the numbers were comparable to what the court had requested. The fact of the matter is Mamlio has been pushing this issue of diversity probably mm -hmm. for over 20 years. Everybody, not everybody who is here currently knows about the battles that Mamley has fought, but That's all true. those battles have been very public and anybody had the op opportunity, anybody here could have presented the, op uh, the likely of a consent decree. We've had uh, lengthy discussions at Mamley as to how we continue to diversify and push our agenda. Many of those conversations have been attempted on the part of Mamley to some of the members of this same council here. 
I think everybody has had an opportunity. This is an opportunity that we could have taken to discuss the consent decree, but this was not an opportunity simply reliant that the members of the task force had to do. Anybody here could have done it. The fact that it has been presented today, it may be something that we have to look at going forward. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, so with regards to the private schools, um, one of the reasons that makes sense in terms of using METCO, Charter, and BPS is that they do reflect the racial diversity of BPS. In terms of majority of those kids are at least uh, black and brown kids in those programs. But the private schools and parochial schools, including them in this preference seems counterintuitive because they don't reflect the diversity. I, I know Councilor Flaherty brought up the fact that there are some uh, wonderful outreach programs, but let's be clear, they're not 80 to 75 or 75% to 80% of those schools are black and brown kids. So I don't understand why you would include private parochial schools in this as a preference. You're not gonna get the same recruitment. So if, if you want me to, I can speak to that, Madam Chair. Um, I think a lot of our discussions were really about how we frame the language in this, um, especially in our, our piece of language in the uh, task form, in the task force, so that it's, it's not clearly, we're not saying that only hire black and brown people. We're trying to craft the language so that we we're still able to accomplish our tasks of really mm -hmm. pushing for diversity within the police department and not excluding other black and brown people from the city who could also make a meaningful um, contribution to the police department. I think uh, there are plenty of young black and brown kids who go to MECO schools, who go to some of the private schools, but also make it a contribution. For me, my thought process when I proposed this idea of creating a preference for BPS students was that I know the makeup of BPS students. I know where they live. I know what their perspective is. I know what their walk has been. And I know what they would bring to this job. So for me, it's really about, well, do we want to exclude other people who are not necessarily BPS students, but who also could make meaningful contributions? And I think to the extent that we can, the city council is free to craft language that does all those things without substantially excluding some of these same kids who grew up in the city who by, by luck, happenstance, um, by virtue of some kind of connection happens to get the opportunity to go to a private school. I know I had the op that opportunity, I did not take it, but I think that shouldn't have excluded me from the opportunity to be a Boston police officer. I agree and I think I understand the balance that this program or any program that is trying to diversify has to make right now. You can, as racial, excuse me, as direct racialized language is probably not gonna pass muster in a court today, that there's ways in which we are trying to recruit and pull from different pools of entities to make sure that we're able to at least cast the widest net, the most diverse net. And so uh, again, the METCO, the BPS, the charter all make sense because when you cast that net, you're casting for all uh, those kids and they're very likely more diverse. But when you include the BC highs or the other private schools, you're actually narrowing the net and, and I think actually um, not helping. And while um, those, we would not want to hurt somebody so much because they went to a private school, let's be honest about the benefits, the networks, and the advantages that they will get by going to that school anyway. So that this is not an exclusion of them. They could easily become a Boston Police Department, a police officer as well. They could, they still have an avenue to it. And whether it's they can, the many ways in which you can get into the school. So, so again, so I'm on the private parochial schools entities that are included in this preference that do not have the diversity of BPS. My, so I think that that helps to strike a better balance with the concerns from Councilor Mejia expressed, Councilor Janey, but also still allows for us to get to those kids who did not necessarily physically go to a BPS school in Boston. Um, I have one quick point to that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I do think it's worth mentioning um, that the task force actually when they released their initial recommendations, it was more aligned with the feedback that the council was giving. Um, and after several listening sessions where there were multiple members of the community uh, that gave feedback and gave pushback to the specific language about the specific recommendation, um, mm -hmm. that was amended uh, to make it a little bit more um, inclusive. Uh, but that was, that was, you know, there was a bunch of back and forth about how do you get it as precise as possible. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of it had to do with community feedback. Mm -hmm. And then um, my, I'm curious who, who's carrying this at the state house. I had asked that in my opening remarks. So who's gonna be your lead sponsor? So I can uh, touch base with our IGR team and get back to you on that question. Um, I think you had also asked about timeline and uh, why are we putting it forth at the moment, um, knowing that you know sessions are wrapping up? Um, it is our intention, uh, should the city council uh, support this and you know uh, choose to uh, approve it, uh, that we would be refiling in the new year. Um, as the uh, as the council is aware, uh, the task force really wrapped up their work uh, in late September, uh, mid October, and we have been in full force in implementation mode um, and try to you know file as quickly as possible uh, and wanted to make sure that we were uh, capturing that momentum. And you know the timeline is the timeline, uh, but we fully intend to take this back up in the new year as well. Mm -hmm. In terms yeah, of the just um, as a point of reference, I've already started doing some outreach to members of the state uh, at the state uh, senate and state reps. So my 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 sense is that we'll get uh, a lot of support on this. Yes, but I I think the my my question is who's carrying it, or who's the individual, senator or rep, who has this, and we'll definitely. Um, get and then in terms of the, since we're on this, the topic of the state house and, and police reform, where's the patrolman's association? Where, where are the unions? Do they support this? The detective union? My biggest concern is right now we are dealing with a back and forth that's pretty with a lot of tension at the state house specifically around police reform, just having passed the house and so on and so forth. We're waiting for the governor to sign it and I'm, I, I feel like there are a lot of officers, a lot of unions who have their kind of backs up feeling that, because they've publicly come out in opposition to this, to the reform at the state house. So now we're gonna introduce something else, another reform, another change at the state house in this particular moment with a lot of tension. So I'm wondering where the support is for the Boston uh, Patrolman's Association, the Detectives Association, or are, are, we, are you literally launching this without their support, knowing that there's state house waiting to oppose this? Um, you want me to speak to that? Yes. So I've had I've had extensive conversations with the president of the BPPA and conversations with the detectives union. The detectives union does not necessarily stand against this. Uh, they're not they've they've not necessarily stand, said that they're going to support it. But I think at the end of the day, for me, we cannot solely rely on the support of the BPPA and other police unions to do some of this work that we're doing. So I get I, I get I, I get what you where you're going as far as what's their support of this. I think there are some who are in support, but as all things, the groups that are against it are probably going to be the most vocal. I think, given the fact that a substantial number of the BPPA members are black and brown people, there is substantial support for this bill. So of course, there are going to be those members who stand against it. So um, just to summarize, you do not have the support formal support of either union right now. I, I, we don't have uh, disapproval of it either. I know a substantial number of members of the BPP are in support of this and the uh, detectives yeah, that's, union. That's, and that's, yeah, that, that is, that is, and I don't doubt that they are in support of, of this as individual members, but we also know um, they speak as a collective, as a body and speak against certain things and have, and specifically on this issue of police reform. So. Uh, or certain aspects, not total, but this is, I'm asking about the political waters. And if there's this sense of urgency that we're going to, as a council, push through something that one, doesn't have a sponsor yet, or will be getting a sponsor, two, is gonna face headwinds that are un, unlike before at this particular moment, all of these different things. So it comes to me as a chair of this committee where, I'm, where to prioritize the limited amount of time that we have as a body. That's what I'm weighing. 
those members had an opportunity to speak during the public hearings. Uh, there was no vocal um, opposition to this specific part of the police task force uh, recommendation, none at all. Thank you. And then in terms of the three years, I actually think that Javier had a good point on the specific residency requirements for three years and how with the look back is today's three years, that there is gonna be an economic divide unless unless those Boston residents are specifically recruited, say from um, deed restricted housing, public housing and other places in Boston where there are higher incidences or higher, excuse me, higher rates of people of color, but also have the protection of, of a certain forms of rent control and certain forms of rent stabilization. So we, there is a, there is a kind of coming to heads of the issue of the residency required. The longer you make it based off of today's times and today's rents, the likelihood that we are going to be um, grabbing in people of a gentrification class versus long-term Boston residents who we know, many of whom are, are leaving, I can tell you right now, leaving Charlestown's housing development to go to Brockton because they're getting section eight vouchers and their vouchers go further there. There's a lot of displacement that's happening in the city of Boston of people of color. And so to think that they, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a tension with that. I, I understand that people have taken this one year also is not helpful in that. Um, and I don't know that this particular high school graduation is going to counter the amount of injury in round of loopholes that uh, that one year provides. So is there a way to craft the language, regardless of the years, um, to have the years limited to either, is there a way to have a residency requirement based off of um, three years consecutively lived in Boston at any point in their life? Or uh, if you could say that they've been here for 10 years at any point in their life, is there is there a way to craft the residency requirement in a way that doesn't favor folks who are able to afford today's rent, right? Doesn't hurt folks who had to leave. Is there, so that's, that's literally my, 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 my intellectual headache. How do you craft this so that you are not hurting people today who don't have the money? People are leaving because they don't have the money to stay here. They cannot afford to stay here. So how do we, how do we craft that? And does anyone, do you guys understand my, my, my headache around this? We do, I do. I know we had some of those same discussions uh, in, in the process of discussing how we're gonna craft a language around this. So uh, to the extent that I know I'm not an expert legislator, um, I think that's something that we all could sit down and figure out how best to craft it. We had those same, this, that very same discussion around residency, if somebody just moves into the city and they graduate a year later, we had all those discussions. We were at this for a long time. The, we had lengthy discussions around this very same issue. So I'm open to the extent that anybody here has an idea that addresses all those concerns we have as it relates to the three-year residency up to the BPS preference. Uh, for me, I think my end goal is always this idea of diversifying the police department. To mm -hmm. the extent that we can do that, we can all be part of the conversation. I'm open to it. I just am wondering how much of this is going to be productive because a lot of the, what we're talking about, well, why this, why not that? If anybody has an idea that does all those things, I am open to it. Um, and I will sit at the table with you and to the extent that I can help craft the language. Yeah, I agree. This, this is something that we talked about. And the, the problem is proving residency of someone in their years of minority, um, you know, when they're 12, 11, 10, uh, is, is difficult to do aside from looking at, you know, their middle school transcripts and seeing what their listed address is. Uh, there's also the administrative burden that this places um, upon making that determination and ensuring that someone meets those qualifications, as well as the, the burden that it places upon the applicant. And in, in the end, we felt that being a resident of Boston at the time that you graduate from, you know, a uh, Boston public school, Medco, parochial school, et cetera, uh, was the, the best uh, compromise uh, to achieve our objectives and with consideration of all those issues. Do you think, do you think it makes sense to have the, that, that graduate of one of those schools, the kind of done, and then or three years 
consecutive living so that you're you're not so it's an and it's not an and these two things it's more of an or so you had to prove that you graduated from boston high school to hit the residency to hit this to hit whatever to prove that you have have roots that you have been here and that you are likely you, you it would also hit i think the recruitment pools that we're trying to do or three to five years i think it's three years now pending and I also say this kind of with the irony that, you know, the mayor did support this and signed it and it's pending, right? So he has signed legislation with three years on it. Then you come back with another form of legislation with one year on it. Like the mayor's kind of got to not speak out of both sides of, he can't do it both ways. You know, this one is in direct opposition to what he signed and passed in May. If, if I could, again, I, I think, both these suggestions have the same effect. So for me, the idea of having somebody not just live in a city for a year, become a police officer is good because three years, it doesn't make you an expert. It puts you in a better place than you would have been for a year. I think the DPS preference, I think for me is an ideal. So if we can push the DPS preference and then still enforce this idea, if you wanna become a police officer, live in a city for three years, then I think the two are not mutually exclusive to the extent that we can do it. I think we should do both. Thank you. Sure we're not walking away from that language about three years um, and happy to have that conversation about uh, the language, your suggestion about consecutive years. Okay. All right. So um, that's it for me. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have it, another round specifically. Um, I kind of just would prefer you raise your blue hands and then um, otherwise I'll just call on you for um, concluding remarks. So I see counselor, oh, oh, all of them have raised their hands. Never mind, we'll just go back in order. Um, so we raised the hands. All right, so we'll just go back in order then. So counselor Braden. Thank you. I, I've been Googling the consent degree. Um, it said that the consent degree faced several legal challenges. And in 20, 2004, after several white, can, white candidates sued the Department for Discrimination, Judge Patty Saris uh, found that the department had achieved racial parity and ruled the provision that mandated hiring one minority candidate for every white recruit as un unconstitutional, um, given that they'd achieved parity. But it's it's a pity that they didn't write in some sort of a requirement that if, if it started to slide, that we could yeah. continue to redress the problem. But it just has gone back down to... To, um, I, I, I'm curious, I, I think the Boston Public Schools career paths, like the legal and protective service studies um, is, is a really, uh, you know, when you're judging um, high school candidates, uh, thinking about their field of study, if they have committed to doing a, a field of study in legal and protective studies and maybe have language skills that those sort of Boston Public High School students or, Schools from a uh, student from a private school, a private or parochial school, that, that they would definitely be more prime candidates for entry into the police department. Uh, you know, some some other criteria that would add to your selection. Uh, uh, you know, just as you would if you had a pre-nursing court track or a, uh, you know, so that 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 this, the career in the police force becomes a. Uh, an obvious and desirable track within the Boston public schools. Uh, and that, you know, that's where they would differentiate themselves from parochial schools and uh, Metco, uh, because those other schools won't necessarily have, have a, a career path uh, that's, that would follow into legal and protective studies. So uh, protective services. So it's just a thought. Um, Thank you for, uh, this is a very good discussion. <laughs> it needs a lot more work, I think, but uh, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Councillor Braden and Google for your, <laughs> your background on the consent decree. Really appreciate that, it really helped a lot. I really do appreciate that. Um, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Informative discussion, it's been helpful. Um, in my district, in the heart of my district is Cathedral High School. Um, it's an excellent school. It's mostly students, it's a, it's a private school. It's mostly students from the South End 
in Roxbury and most of the students are communities of color. Um, many, many live in the public housing developments as well. Um, I have a good relationship with them. Their parents don't make all that much money, but what the parents do is they just work as hard as they can to pay the bill, uh, pay the tuition bill. Most of the students are on um, financial aid, uh, but I would not want to see a, a student such as the Cathedral High School students be excluded. Um, you know, this city kids, they know the city, they've been here a long time. Um, they've had nothing handed to them and they're, they're doing the best they can for their children. They, the parents think that this school is the best opportunity for their child. Um, so I wanna just stress that, that there's a lot of uh, parents that have children in the private schools that um, live, live in poverty as well, um, especially in communities of color in, in my district, which extends from South, South End into Chinatown um, a lot of a lot of public housing, but I, I would want to make sure that that is a critical part of the discussion to include um, private schools. There's an, there's several others. There's Cristo Ray over in Dorchester. It's a private school um, in, in Savin Hill. I think most of the students, high school students, are uh, communities of color. I, I think I think we have to give these students an opportunity um, to participate in this program. Um, and, and not exclude them. This is this this is about bringing people together. And these divisive issues, um, you know, it's important that we try our best to include everybody and to um, not exclude anybody. But I, I would not want to see um, my constituents or Boston constituents residents um, excluded because they went to a private school based on the fact that their parents thought it was the best opportunity for them, even though they um, make very, very little money. So that's, that's my uh, final comment. But again, thank you, Councillor Edwards, and um, looking forward to a follow up on this important discussion. Thank you. I am. Um, so if I understand, Councillor Flynn, the, the private schools actually something is very important for you for this language and keeping it. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's right, Councillor Edwards. Um, I, I, I know from experience, from talking to people, a lot of parents that do send their kids to private schools, such as the cathedral, um, cathedral, um, they, they, they don't have any money. And most of the students there are on financial aid. And they just, the, the school itself tries to get money from the business community, from whoever they can to um, pay the bills and the, the parents pay little money even though it's a private school. So I think it's important to include private schools in this, uh, in this discussion and debate. And, and in the language. In the language, yep, yeah. yep. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Councilor Edwards. Councilor Flaherty, then Councilor Mejia. Thank you, Madam Chair, I've seen you. Councilor Campbell, you are not here. I don't, I don't think I wanna make sure. Councilor Campbell. Okay, I didn't think so. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Obviously, thank you for your support of the uh, current home rule petition up at um, up at Beacon Hill with the three year. And if there's a way we can combine the two, um, I think we're saying we're we're all saying the same things. We want uh, more opportunity for city kids, and we want to make sure we enhance uh, the ranks of the department that have a department that reflects the the faces uh, and the languages that are spoken here. So I totally get it and want to be supportive of that. I think it's going to be a multi pronged approach with uh, you know as many. Uh, sort of tools in the toolbox is necessary to bring about that. Um, and I obviously concur with the previous speaker. And again, I'm always, uh, um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm a bashful about, uh, I'm not bashful about advocating for, for BCI and the great work that they do uh, educating, um, you know, young men uh, at uh, over at 150 Morrissey Boulevard in Dorchester, but they've gone to great lengths and there are a number of students very, very uh, similarly situated like Cathedral uh, and Crystal Ray that, um, are worthy and want uh, and, and obviously need opportunities like these. So um, hopefully that, uh, and to Council Braden's point, I mean, sometimes less is better with this type of legislation. Uh, it goes up to Beacon Hill if it's amenable, then they'll just take their hacks at it. But um, more importantly, um, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing here uh, that's in the best interest of the city is 
uh, not ripe to challenge. And uh, because this is a highly competitive uh, situation, uh, a seat in the academy at the Boston Police Department, uh, highly sought after, uh, and folks will go to great lengths uh, to sort of protect, uh, you know, their their rights and their access to to that opportunity. So, I think sometimes less is better. The more we put in, um, and or the more that uh, it broadens the the uh, the wider uh, and the more susceptible it is to a legal challenge. And and I think that that needs to to be taken into consideration here because we want what's best for the residents of our city, we want to uh, sort of accomplish our goals. But I think if we push in one particular direction or another particular direction, or if we continue to add stuff, then uh, not only does, uh, you know, I guess it, uh, it, it get, gets tweaked up at Beacon Hill anyways, but, um, you know, particularly if it goes up as an amendable document and then we lose sort of control over it uh, as a municipality, but nonetheless, um, we just want to make sure that whatever we put forth, it's, it's tight. Uh, and not uh, it doesn't have its nose sticking out there and be ripe for challenge. And just lastly, if I could just ask um, from and appreciate the panel and appreciate the work that you guys do. And I know you've uh, gone to great lengths to to answer as many questions as we can. And again, we're coming at it from, I think, a very similar perspective, despite that, you know, I'm, I was pretty fired up earlier about uh, making sure that we're we're uh, we're attacking the uh, mattress address uh, phenomenon that does exist and uh, is in, in dire need of being put out to pasture because it will go a long way in protecting and providing more seats uh, per class. But I just want to see if anyone has the latest civil service list, particularly the breakdown uh, from the last recruiting classes in, in terms of how many disabled veterans, how many veterans, how many sort of widows or sons and daughters uh, killed in the line of duty. Um, you know, and then obviously then residents that don't have those preferences. I, I'd like to kind of get a sense as to the breakdown uh, I think the last couple of classes that were put on, I think they've been close to a hundred uh, recruits, hundred candidates, but I'd like to get a sense of a breakdown to, to see um, because that breakdown is going to continue. If not, it may, it may even exacerbate and the, the chair recognized that given uh, COVID and the economy now going to be lagging. And uh, oftentimes those are situations where people either lose their job or get laid off. Uh, and then they tend to turn towards, you know, uh, their local municipality and or civil service position. And in those instances, we do see an uptick. When the economy dips down, we do see an uptick in, in uh, applications for, for police officer and for a firefighter in the city. And that has been the case uh, over the years. So a breakdown would be very helpful of me uh, as it pertains to say the last recruiting class or last couple of recruiting classes, specifically how many disabled veterans, how many veterans, how many widows or sons or daughters of those killed in the line of duty, um, and then the uh, then other residents with non civil service preference because ultimately that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to find a way to connect that sort of non um, I guess the the, the non civil service preference individual to an opportunity on the police department, and we're basically creating a new preference for them to be able to compete. And I'd really like to see the breakdown just to see exactly how many slots we're we're potentially talking about that um, that this preference. Uh, that's in front of us, this home rule would, would allow, um, you know, uh, young men and women in Boston to compete for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Well, were they, I, were they, I, Madam Chair, will they answer that question or is that we're going to do it at the end? Uh, I, I apologize. Um, did anyone want to take the question? I can provide that information for, uh, uh, to Thank the you, council uh, for the last three years. That'd be great. Thank you, Michael. If you could get that to the chair, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Mejia. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is, um, okay, so I'm just trying to, just because I just speak from my heart, so I'm really trying to learn how to speak within the constraints that I find myself in right now. So bear with me. I think um, that the city of Boston is being presented with an amazing opportunity to really rethink and reimagine how we include and how do, how do we recruit and engage and create a real pipeline that reflects the diversity of the city of Boston. And Councillor Edwards said something that really struck with me earlier about the fact that the changing demographics here in the city of Boston are changing fast and furious. Um, people who grew up in the city can no longer afford to live here and will be priced out every single day. And if we could seize this particular moment in time and take the language that, um, that we have in front of us 
And I agree, and I said this earlier, if we could remove the private school private uh, school um, clause out of this language, then I think we're really heading towards leveling the playing field. And I think that that feels to me more equitable, if that's the goal. The goal is to be more equitable for low income, people of color to have an opportunity to get to this point, then I think that that feels right in terms of getting to that space. And then I do agree with President Council Janey's earlier um, question in terms of the data, in terms of who um, uh, have, who, were tar who has taken advantage of, of, of this um, in prior years, um, because that will be really telling. I think that that data is, inf is important information um, to have. And then, you know, the, the last piece, I know I talked about, we've been having this conversation for 50,000 years. I, I, I know that sounds a little bit sassy, but the reality is, is that we can't keep having the same conversation and expecting different results, right? Like if we're really serious about changing um, how we do business here in the city of Boston, this is our moment and we have to seize it. And I think, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm so stuck on the, um, the residence piece of it being three. I think that doesn't go far enough for me. I don't even think five years is enough to be honest with you. I, I, think, I think you should have gone to, I think you should have been in Boston public schools from K through 12, how about that? <laughs> so I think that that really shows the experience of, of living in the city of Boston. So if we're gonna go, we might as well go as hard as we can and be as bold as we can. Um, and why should we um, just settle for whatever little crumbs we get? We've, we're tired of that. And I don't have any questions. I just have lots of comments and I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Mejia. But for those of us who did not grow up in Boston and did not go to Boston public schools, uh, there are entire lives, those of us like me, I still feel I serve um, my community. Um, I'm Boston by choice, maybe not Boston by birth. And so I do, I do appreciate um, uh, everyone's comments, but speaking, I think on behalf of majority of now Bostonians who did not grow up here, um, and the majority of the folks that we serve actually, this is Boston, right? And so I do think that there's, there's a balance, balance that we need to strike um, about uh, what it means to know, to serve, and to love a community. And um, I think the three years helps to strike that balance um, because, well, not, every, not all of us were privileged enough to be born in Boston, okay? So I just wanna make sure we put that out there. It's, it's not, a, not a knock or anything like that, but just, just as we talk about you know, what it means to serve, who, who it means to be here. Um, and then let's, let's, let's not forget about the, I think 25% of Bostonians are immigrants anyway, um, and didn't grow up here and didn't speak English and so on and so forth. So let's just, let's just remember the context that we're talking about this beautiful diverse city. Um, so I don't have any further questions. I do think that there's, there seems to be some, some balance striking that we can on the residency. Also because let's be clear, the mayor supported legislation that does something different. So that's pending right now. Three years is pending supported by the mayor. This one does not have that. So I, I would think even just to be consistent um, with what he signed before, we might want to do that now if we're gonna do something. Um, and then I, I don't hear agreement actually amongst my colleagues about private versus uh, not, or excluding private schools uh, versus including them. There is a, there's a split. And just for my sake, and it makes more sense than to be bigger and to be narrower in, in what we include in the language. Um, because I, I, I hear outright, people will not support this if it does exclude private schools. Um, and so uh, I leave this back to the administration. If you want, if you have another draft that you wanna get back to us, um, or we can continue this conversation in the new year with a new draft and, um, and try and do it then. So that's really up to you guys. Something that I, Madam Chair, thank you so much also uh, for all of the time that you've allotted to this um, and for all the consideration. Um, and it's very clear from uh, just this conversation between the council themselves. Uh, you guys are also uh, feeling the tensions that the task force felt 
of trying to uh, strike balance between all of these competing and very valid uh, interests, right? Um, I think that we are definitely not walking away from that language related to uh, uh, the residency that the mayor had previously uh, signed. Um, and so we're more than happy to amend that. One thing I want to make very clear though is our goal would be uh, to get this passed by the council this year, uh, to continue uh, to move with this uh, expeditiously and to be able to uh, refile this uh, in the new year um, and to be able to push as hard as possible um, in the state legislature for this. So I understand there's a ton of work uh, with very limited time uh, for the council, uh, but that would be our preference and our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to close this hearing unless any of my colleagues have some final remarks. Seeing no blue hands so fast, um, I'm going to go ahead and call uh, this hearing. Thank you all for participating. Look forward to hearing from you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.